Now, if you have your Bibles, open the book of Revelation, chapter 15. Book of Revelation, chapter 15. The book of Revelation, chapter 15. I want to begin reading this morning in verse number 7. Verse number 7 of the book of Revelation, chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15, beginning with verse number 7. Make that, let's read verse number 6. Revelation 15, verse 6. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And then in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 16, I'd like to ask you to keep your Bibles open here at Revelation 16 this morning. We'll be bringing a message from this chapter. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vial of the wrath of God upon the earth. I want to bring you a message this morning on the subject, no place to hide, no place to hide. And the subject we're going to be dealing with this morning is that one of these days God is begun again to pour out His wrath upon this earth, and as soon as God speaks this to these seven angels to go dump out the seven vials of His wrath on the earth, that there honestly will be no place to hide. You might hide from me. You may hide from the, the, the church. You may hide from the United States government and run off to Canada. You may hide from the law and run to Mexico or go to another country or somewhere where nobody can find you. But I'd like to say to everyone in this church this morning before we even go to the Lord in prayer, before we read any more scripture today, that you cannot hide from God. Nobody hides from God. God knows everything you've ever done, every place you've ever went, every word you've ever spoken, the things that you hid in darkness and did, God knows them. And there will come a day when God will begin to punish men for the sins of their life, those that are not saved. And in that day, the Bible said they'll cry out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them and cover them from the face of God that sits on the throne uh, but there'll be no place to hide. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for health and strength and the blessings of life. Thank you, dear God, for another privilege that we have, Lord, to be able to come to you in prayer. Now, God, I pray that you would bless this service today. Dear Lord, I pray you'd do that that men cannot do. And I pray that you'd do a miracle in our hearts and life. We pray, dear God, that you'd speak to hearts in this place today. Lord, those that may be listening by means of radio or whatever, Lord, however they hear this message, Lord, I pray, God, your Holy Spirit of the Lord will use it to bring conviction of sin and bring folks to repentance to salvation before it's too late. Whatever you do for us, we'll praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I'm going to be talking to you a few minutes this morning on the subject, No Place to Hide. Now, you that have studied the book of Revelation know that the book of Revelation is written, and the Bible says in the book of Revelation that these sayings are true and faithful. Everything in the entire book of the Revelation will come to pass just as God said that it would. And we're going to deal with a chapter this morning, Revelation chapter 16, that is going to be taking place on the worst time that the world ever has or ever will see. The Bible calls this period the Great 
tribulation. And it's a time and the Old Testament called Jacob's trouble. You know now that God is dealing mainly with Gentiles. And you and me there this morning, we're, uh, most of us, I reckon, are Gentiles saved by God's grace. God is dealing mainly this morning with the Gentile nation. But there will come a time when the Lord will go back to Israel and begin to deal specifically with them. And as we'll see maybe uh, a little bit later on, how that God will go back, as we see in the book of Romans, and deal mainly and basically with the Jewish nation. Now, when that time comes, we believe, is when Jesus comes. For example, if Jesus Christ was to come this morning, we'd hear a great sound of a trumpet and a great shout. And everybody in this building that's saved this morning would automatically be translated. Just all of a sudden, we would be with the Lord in the clouds, in the air. And you who are not saved would be looking around here wondering where about everybody went and begin to cry and scream and pull your hair and ask God to help you. But of course, it'll be too late. Jesus has already come and gone. And then after that, the Bible tells us that they're going to, God will begin to go and begin to turn His attention and His mercies and His grace and His focusing back towards the Jewish nation. After we're gone, the Lord begins to deal with them. And then the Bible said there's a man steps out called the man of sin. And this man is called Antichrist. He is the opposite of Christ. He will rule the whole world. The Bible tells us that he causeth all. In other words, he's going to be over the whole show. He'll be running the show in that day, and he'll cause everyone to have the mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And without that mark called the mark of the beast, nobody will be able to buy or sell or get a job or have a social security number or anything when that day comes. Well, the last three and a half years of this time, the Bible called the Great Tribulation. I mean, it's great. It's terrible. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21, Jesus said that this time was like never had been a time nor ever would be a time. I know there's been some terrible times on this earth. There's been times in the war when people had it rough and didn't have much food to eat and had hard things, terrible things happen. But the Lord said that this time that I'm going to be talking about this morning, what, there never has been a time like it. There never will be another time like it again. It's called the Great Tribulation or the Wrath of God. Now, I want you to pay attention to that word wrath this morning. Don't you, I want you to remember that wrath means anger, fierce indignation, not hell. Now, nowhere in the Bible, I don't believe, does the word wrath refer to hell. I mean, when a sinner dies and he's lost without God, he goes to hell. And he burns there forever and forever. But when God speaks about his wrath, he's talking about punishing people while they're still living on this earth. And so the wrath of God this morning will be poured out up on the earth as Revelation 16 and verse 1 prize, uh, uh, would tell us this morning. I believe the basic thing to understand in the book of Revelation is getting your divisions right. Once you get it divided in your mind right, you can understand it. It's not that uh, hard to understand once you get the divisions right in your mind and find out where Jesus comes. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, the great voice speaks, Come up hither. And John goes up, a picture of the church. That's me and you who are saved going up to be with Jesus. And then God begins to deal with this world. I know there's a lot of people today that say God is love. God's love. He's a good old gray-headed man sitting up there in a rocking chair. And every time out there in Hollywood and dance hall, disco places, we're out getting drunk and swapping wise and doing everything. God just looks down at them and smiles and say, well, it'll be all right. If they're not so bad. They really don't mean to be doing wrong. But friend, they have God pictured entirely opposite and entirely backward from what the Bible declares God to be. Did you know this morning that the Bible says God is love, but the Bible also teaches God is a God of wrath. God is a God that gets angry. God is angry this morning, matter of fact. 
Do you know that God's mad this morning? You say, well, preacher, I've always thought Jesus loves me. This I know. He does love you, but he's also angry at this world this morning. How do you know? Because the Bible said in Psalm 7 and verse 11, God is angry with the wicked every day. That's a far cry from the lovey-dovey, gray-headed God that people try to put forth to the world this morning. I believe God is angry when God looks down and sees false religion and he sees everything under the sun being done in his name and his name being blasphemed and prostituted and sold and cheated on. And he sees all that going on in the church. I heard about a church out in a certain state not long ago that moved out all the pews and brought in a band and had a dance. And everybody got drunk, and a couple of the leaders of the church got drunk, and one of the deacons told one of the other leaders of the church through the window and cut him all out and bloody his face, put him in the hospital. And, of course, you know, the sign out front saying, The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. People giving money to support, calling that the work of God. I believe God looks down this morning. He sees all that junk going on in his name, and he sees homosexual preachers, and he sees all kind of uh, crooked dealings and all that stuff going on in his name, and it makes him angry. He's angry at sin. They hear, God hears them cursing his saints, blaspheming his name. He sees Madeline Mary O'Hara going around the country trying to get the, get the uh, prayer took out of her school, trying to get the name in God we trust, took off of our money, trying to just kick God right out of the country completely and right out of the picture. And he sees that, and he's angry. He sees tri scientists trying to prove the Bible's not true. He's seeing the wicked persecuting the poor and the needy. He's watching men worship themselves on movie stars in Hollywood. He sees a met pleasure, mad, immoral, lying, cheating, stealing church members and preaching uh, preachers who are hypocrites and brother church people who are more worried about a scratch on their new car than there are souls dying and going to hell. And God looks down and he sees this. And he looks around and he sees it all. He sees what goes on behind closed doors in parked automobiles and up behind shady deals and insurance business and politics. And God looks at it all and he says, I'm angry. I'm sick of it. I've had it up to here. My wrath will be poured out. And God here begins to pour out his wrath. He's been storing it up for 2,000 years, you know. I mean, he's had a long time. The Lord's kind of been pretty quiet for the last 2,000 years. And every sin that's been committed in the past 2,000 years, God has watched it take place. And brother, the Lord is beginning to store up his wrath. And it's kind of like he's got a big bow and arrow. And every time people sin... He pulls that arrow back towards just a little bit further. And every time he sees crooked dealing, uh, wheeling, dealing, lying, cheating, chilling, cheating, immorality, ungodliness, drunkenness, hatred, everybody high on dope, and God begins to look at that, and he pulls back that bow harder and harder and harder and harder. And he's been stretching that thing back for nearly 2,000 years. Psalm 7 and verse 12 said, If he turn not, he will whet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. And so you see this morning that God's pour, pulling back his bow. And he's been stretching it back for 2,000 years. And he sees George Harrison and get up there and John Lennon say, We're more popular than Jesus Christ. He jerks that bow back a little bit harder. He sees Madeline Mary O'Hara get the prayer of the school. He jerks it back a little harder. He sees soap operas telling you and trying to teach you that it's all right to run around on your husband or wife, live like the devil. He pulls it back a little harder. And finally, finally, after all of these years, God's been patient. God's been loving. He finally lets go of that era in this chapter I'm going to read to you today. Here's the time when God lets his arrow go and it's pointed right toward the heart of old earth. You say, Brother Danny, I'm, I'm here this morning and I'm saved. It scares me for you to talk about God's wrath being poured out on earth. Well, I got the best news you ever heard in your life. Thank God, thank God this morning. He'll not put his wrath on his children. Brother, I tell you, if there wasn't no hell, 
If there wasn't no such thing as hell to go to when you die, it'd be enough to shout all over this house this morning just to miss the wrath of Almighty God. You say, how do you know, Brother Danny? I'll give you two verses of Scripture right quick to prove to you and promise you something that you Christians can always remember to prove to you that God ought to put His wrath on His children. Number 1, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9. You don't have to turn to it. I'll just give it to you and give you the next one. Then the Bible said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one promise. God only has to say something one time for it to be sure and be real. But just in case somebody had a doubt, God said it again in Romans 5, 9. They'll be easy to remember. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Romans 5, 9. The Bible said much more now being justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. There's a promise from God's Word that I won't ever have to drink blood. There's a promise from God's Word. I won't ever have to break out in sores. Thank God He will not put His wrath on His children. So we see here this morning that God is going to do to the world what He did to Egypt back in the book of Exodus. God always has a type in the Old Testament of things He does. God, God works by cycles. And every time He does something in the Old Testament... He would a lot of times do it again in the New Testament in a different type. And in the Old Testament, God put the plagues on Egypt. God's people were in bondage to Egypt. And God called Moses to go and preach and grab them and lead them out of Egypt's bondage. And you know the contest with Pharaoh, type of the Antichrist. And God gave Moses the power to smite Egypt with all of these plagues. Well, here we see that God's going to do that very same thing again, except this time it'll be the whole world and not just the land of Egypt. Now, here we see in the Word of God that God deals with people in that way. If you'll remember, God destroyed the world one time with a flood. Everybody remember that? God destroyed the world the first time with a flood. God promised Noah that he never would destroy the world again with a flood. Never will. You, you might have some local floods, but you'll never have another flood drown the whole world. But God said that he would destroy the world again. Next time it'll be by fire and not by water. And Noah this morning was a picture and a type of the Jews who are saved through this terrible time that I'm talking about the wrath of God. Noah made it through the flood, thank God. And thank God there will be a Jewish remnant and people who believe and are saved during this time who will make it through this time. You remember that Noah lived at the close of the age. Matthew 24 describes this time also as those of an age. Noah and his house were preserved through a great and sore judgment. You remember in the tribulation, in Revelation chapter 12, Israel fled away where she had a place prepared for her. And Israel is preserved through this great and terrible judgment. Do you remember how that Noah and his house came onto an earth, swept clean, and then started a new age? Thank God in the, the remnant that will go through this time that I'm talking about will also come out and start out on a new earth. And it's called the thousand years which Jesus reigned on this earth. But before the flood, here's what we got to be thankful for this morning. Before the flood, before the flood came, before Noah got in the ark, before Noah was in the boat, there was a man by the name of Enoch that walked with God. And he was not, for God took him up out of the way. And Enoch, the picture of a church, translated, who should never see death, who never would have to die, who never would have to be put in the grave. He is a picture of you and I who are walking around down here just before the wrath of God pours out and God takes Enoch up before Noah goes through the flood. And thank the Lord this morning, you and I, Enoch, are a picture of Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Seven's God's rapture number. And brother God pulled old Enoch out of there and he pulled Enoch out before the flood ever came. And so we see this morning that God will not put His wrath on His children. 
That makes me glad I'm saved, don't it you? And if you know what, if you're here this morning and you ain't saved, I'd be getting saved if I was you. Because this time that I'm going to be talking about now is just around the corner. All right, now the Lord's pulling back his hair, and now he lets it go. He lets it go in the form of seven angels. Finally, God said, I'm sick of it. I've heard all that cussing I want to see here. I, I've seen all that adultery I want to see. Go ahead. He pulls out seven angels. Seven's God's number of a complete cycle. And God said, go your ways. Every one of those angels had a vial. A vial is a bowl. And every one of them's bowl was full. And he said, you go first, you go second, you go third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. These seven angels begin to go out and pour out their bowls or vials of the wrath of God up on the earth. So let's see what happens when these seven angels come. Now what I'm going to do by the help of the Lord is take these first five angels this morning and bring this to a close. And then the Lord willing tonight, we're going to continue with the sixth and seventh angels. We see in the sixth and seventh angels what we call the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus. And so tonight we're going to be talking about the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of the Lord with the sixth and seventh angels. So the first angel goes out and the Bible said in verse number two, here's what happened. The Bible said the first wind. Revelation 16 and verse two. And poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. You remember that I told you that this will be the time when the Antichrist, the beast, is reigning the mark of the beast. And he has everybody have that number on their right hand or on their forehead. And without that mark on your hand or forehead, they'll begin to make it very rough on you. And it'll be mandatory before this time is over that everyone receive the mark. But brother, if a man takes that mark, he's asking for God's wrath. He's asking for trouble. He seals his doom because this first angel goes out and he dumps out his vow on the earth. And the Bible says that this uh, all of a sudden men begin to break out in big sores. I don't know. God may just do it miraculously and let them break out in a sore. On the other hand, God may let the mark, the ink, maybe the uh, uh, invisible ink that they use for the mark uh, catch some kind of disease or something and, and get infected with the human blood. I don't know how God will do it, but all of a sudden every man that has the mark of the beast will have sores on him. Have you ever seen people with sores on them? Just broke out in old, putrefying, noisome, grievous sores. You know what the word noisome means? It means malignant. And they're breaking out with these sores. And rather just old pus running out of them. And no medicine to get them fixed. Did you know scientists are discovering all the time now, scientists are discovering new diseases and doctors are finding out new diseases and they don't know what causes them, don't have any cure for them and people are breaking out even right now while I'm standing talking to you. People are catching diseases that medical history has never heard tell of. And brother, new ones being discovered every day. Don't you think God's going to let this world get by with the way she's been living, brother? Don't you think you can spit in the face of the Holy God and walk on the blood of Jesus Christ and just float right on by and get by with it? God may let you get by for a while. One day when you got sores all over your body, you'll think different. The Bible says it came, came to pass. You say, well, Brother Danny, that's spiritual, that's symbolic. Yeah, you try your best to hope it is. I found out a good way to read the Bible. The Bible means what it says, says what it means. And the only time God's speaking in symbols and power, He always tells you when He is. He's always careful to let you know when He's speaking in parable, speaking in symbol. Here it don't say anything about a parable. It don't say anything about a symbol. It don't say anything about anything being a spiritual or or hidden, or something like that. Brother, it is happening. The angel pours out his vial, and men break out in great sores. But no sooner is that done, no sooner does that happen, than the second angel comes out right behind him. 
And the Bible said in verse 3, look at it with me if you will, Revelation 16 and verse 3, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. Now you remember, the first one poured out his vial on what? The earth. The second one poured out his vial on the sea. So, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And so we see that the second angel comes out right behind the first one. No sooner are men beginning to get these balls on them. And no sooner do they have all these sores all over them until God's second angel of wrath comes down. And he pours out his vial on the sea. And the Bible says that the water in the sea becomes like a blood of a dead man. Just turn in the uh, just red black blood as, as of a dead man. And so we see this morning that, my dear friends, this water of uh, the sea, it, the Bible says everything in it dies. Now, you know what that would do? That kills all the fish. That kills all the shrimp. That kills all the lobsters. And in some countries of this world, there are people that live off of the sea. They live off of fish. They live off of shrimp and lobsters and crabs and, and things that, that, that survive in the ocean and in the sea. But here God turns these waters. And brother, he, he switches these and turns them into the blood of a dead as a dead man. And the Bible says that every living soul died in the sea. Can't you imagine how it'll be around McDowell County? When they'll come on the news, we have this special report, folks. Something strange has happened. There's been a lot of strange things happening in the past few months. Not, not to mention the great plague. Schools are being set up to treat people for the plague. Schools are being used now. School is called off. It's called a national disaster. And schools are out because of the sores that people are breaking out with. It's not just here in the United States. It's all over the world. And the news bulletin will go on to say, just in this special report from UPI or Associated Press, just in, they're telling us that something strange is happening. All the merchants down at the sea say all the fish are dying. They can't get any fish. And they're stinking and laying on top of the water. And brother God's wrath is beginning to be poured out. And there ain't a thing in this world man can do about it. Brother, not a thing in this world that man's going to do. People will starve. People will be more hungry than they've ever been before. The Bible said in Proverbs 13, 25, the belly of the wicked shall want. Did you know, brother, God said, you've lived in pleasure, you've lived in sin, you've lived in wickedness. Now your belly's going to cry out for something to eat, and there'll be none for you there. But no sooner does that happen. We want to move right on here this morning. No sooner does that take place than the third angel comes right after him. You see, God's wrath is like a woman starting her labor pain to have a baby. A woman can say, well, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. But as soon as those labor pains stop, there ain't no turning back then, friend. Once they start, you go all the way through with it. I remember I heard this girl screaming in the hospital one time, and brother, she was having a baby, and she was screaming, I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it. And I thought, brother, it's a little bit late now, sister. You've got it whether you want it or not. And I'm here to tell you, that's the same way God's wrath is. Once it starts, the Bible said they'll say peace and safety, but sudden destruction cometh upon them as prevail upon a woman with child. And brother, once those labor pains start once God turns it loose once God opens a gate for that first angel the rest of them's going to be right behind him Amen. ain't no stopping it God about the third angel God ain't going to look down and feel sorry for everybody and cut it off once it starts it got to go all the way out the third angel comes out you know what he does let's see verse 4 the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains at the springs and the mountains of waters, and they became blood. Why'd he do that, Brother Danny? Why would God turn Catawba River into blood? Why would God turn Muddy Creek into blood? Why would God turn the whole Mississippi River into blood? Well, he tells you why he's going to do it. Verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and washed and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. They've killed your people, God. They've shed your blood. 
communists that shed the blood of your people, God. And these people in the world, they've killed your, your children. And thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another vote out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. I tell you, this angel goes down, brother, and he dumps out his water on the, his bowl of wrath out on the waters and streams and the, and the rivers, brother. And he goes back up there and says, Amen, Lord, you've done the right thing. They've killed preachers. They've killed uh, prophets. They've killed your people and hated them and shed their blood. Now God's going to give them blood to drink. See how they like that. If you're here this morning, you're here in that time. You don't get saved and you get left behind when Jesus comes. There's some of you sitting right here in this, in this building this morning may live to see that day when God turns the water to blood. Now, it didn't just say it was red, brother. It was blood. B-O-F-B-L-O-O-D, blood. It was blood. And the Bible says that the animals, no doubt, will, will be uh, as, as the ones in the seas already died, and no doubt the animals will be getting thirsty. And, brother, you'll get up one morning. I can imagine some old man here in Marion getting up or out in Los Angeles, up in New York, down in Florida somewhere getting up, and he's had nightmares all night. And he looks up and says, My God, when's these sores going to go away? Oh, these old sores are getting all on me. And he hears these reports on the news, turned on the radio. We interrupt you to tell you this special bulletin. The sea is still turned to blood. The fish are dying. He just turned it off saying, I can't stand no more bad news. This is the most terrible time. Who would have ever thought this would have happened to her world? What's happening? What's happening? And he goes in there to try to get him some water. And he goes that morning, turns on that spigot of water. And remember during the night, God's third angel come out, brother, and turned all the fountains and waters to blood. And he turns on that spigot, brother, and he gets him a glass of water. And he knows it has a little bit of red tint to it at first and then it begins to get a little redder and a little redder and the next thing you know just solid blood begins to pour out in his spigot and he screams and throws a glass down and says oh I'm going crazy brother it's like a horror movie coming through you've seen these horror movies where people everywhere they go something just haunts them God's going to bring it to pass right here in real life in technicolor 3D vision brother he'll bring it to pass and brother people get to try to take a shower and just blood come out of the shower and go running screaming through the house. No water to drink. No water to drink. You say, what will people do, brother? i tell you what they'll do. After they get thirsty enough, they'll start drinking blood. I don't believe I can ever get that thirsty. There's people that's done it before. There's been Navy cure crews and people out on the ships and boats where everybody died but them, brother. They killed each other and eat each other and drunk each other's blood to stay alive. They'll do it here in Marion, too. You say, you are absolutely wildest preacher I've ever heard in my life. All I'm doing is reading you what the Bible says. I, I ain't said anything that ain't wrote right here in front of you. God said he'd turn the rivers and the streams to blood. You know where that water in your house comes from? It comes from the rivers and streams and the fountains. You know, the other day they come on the radio and and up on, he now had a special on TV on the news said, residents of Marion, North Carolina are not supposed to drink any of the, any of the water, you know, in the city limits here the last few days. And everybody said, oh, no, what's happening, you know? And everything, worried about what, uh, what was happening to our water supply here in the, in, the, in the city. And a lot of people, I don't know, but when I first heard that, I got so thirsty. Didn't you? And one day I was uptown, and I got to thinking about it. I couldn't drink no water, and I was so thirsty I couldn't stand it. Just knowing that I couldn't have any, I reckon. And you you imagine, that's just a small little warning, brother. Just a small warning. God's trying to tell people what's to come in the future. You say, well, I just don't see how that can happen. You know what the Lord can do? He can make anything happen he wants to happen. Don't you sit there and say, well, I just don't figure out how. He's like the lion, brother. Somebody come through one time and they said, here's the lion. He's the king of the forest. And they said, you know where the lion sleeps? He said, no, just anywhere he wants to. That's the way God is. You know what God does? He does anything he wants to. That's what he does. 
and you're a fool to stand in his way. Brother, I'm here to tell you this third angel comes out. You imagine it getting cold in some parts of the world, a big red snow falling. How about that much red snow out in your yard? Try to freeze some the ice cubes, be about a dark pink. Try to drink some, try to lick a little bit of the water out of it. I don't I don't want to be around you. I mean personally you can have it as far as I'm concerned. I just assume the Lord just come and get me and take me on this morning so I won't have to be there. And you say, oh, I want to be cool and smoke pot. And do that. Go ahead, stay here and have the mark of the beast and drink bud if you want to. I want to go to glory. And be over yonder with a river. The Bible says it's pure as crystal. I mean, where we can just reach down and just get all we want, boy. I mean, that's, that's, that's wonderful, folks, compared to what this world's going to have to go through. But right quickly this morning, let's see what the fourth angel does. Right behind the third one comes the fourth one. The Bible said in verse number 8, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. God's getting the whole universe here. First he gets the earth, next he gets the sea, next he gets the rivers, and then, brother, he gets the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. You know what they done? You'd say, Preacher, if I was in that shape, I'd repent. I'd get there and I'd say, God save me. I'd take a knife and I'd kill myself. I'd do anything if that really come to happen to me. You know what they do? Look and see what they do in verse 9. Men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which have power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him the glory. They don't repent, they just cuss. In that day, men's hearts will be so hard. You see, the Holy Ghost is moving now and bringing conviction of sin and drawing and woo. And, but when the church goes, the Holy Ghost goes. And brother, men's hearts will be so hard in that day that they'll wake up and drink blood and slam the glass down in the seat and break and look up towards God and say, blankety, blank, blank, and cuss God. God's the one that has the power over those plagues. And here in this story, in the fourth angel's uh, portion, the Bible says he scorched them. The Lord turns the thermostat up. He runs the show. He can turn the thermostat up and burn you up. He can turn the thermostat down and freeze you to death. And here, God turns the thermostat up. And the sun get so hot it starts scorching people with fire. You know, the scientists tell us, and I'm just throwing this in here, that in 1982, that's next year, about 10 or 11, 10 months from now, in 1982, that all of the planets, the nine planets, are going to be in a straight line. First time it's happening in a long time, years and years and years. And when all those planets get in that straight line, all their gravity is going to be pulling the same direction off of the sun. And all of that gravity is going to be pulling this way from the sun towards the earth. And it's going to cause big, huge firestorms on the sun. And the sun will begin to explode and have big firestorms. And they said the heat could be real, greatly intense in 1982. I said 1982, folks. Now, I'm not saying that's the way God will do it. Probably not. But I'm saying you are seeing right now how easily God can bring to pass what he said in his word. And God will turn the heat up. The men will be scorched. And they'll walk around in the blazing heat trying to hide from the sun. And brother, instead of getting right, they just cuss God. Right after that, the fifth angel comes out. And he pours out his vial upon the seat of the beast. That's the beast place where he'll be reigning from, his throne, Antichrist, and his kingdom. That's the beast kingdom was full of darkness. The next angel comes out and smites the earth with darkness. You say, how, how, you, know, how you know it won't just be right there in the, in the Antichrist 
vicinity because it says his kingdom. At this time, his kingdom is going to be spread out, friend. I mean, his kingdom will be smoked with darkness, pitch black darkness. You ever been out in where it's so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of you? And I mean, you flip a light and there can't no lights turn on. The sun's out, the stars are out, the moon's out, no light whatsoever. People have already broke out in sores, scrambling around over top of each other, killing each other, drinking blood, cussing, fighting, killing, lying, stealing, breaking in stores and getting things. And when this comes to pass, you remember why happened up in New York City a few years when they had that blackout? You remember how people went wild then? That's the way this will be in this time, except about 10,000 times worse. You know what they do here? Let's read it, verse 10. I want everybody in this church to read this verse with me. Revelation 16, verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. They don't repent. They just cuss God. And here, after this fifth angel pours out his vials, they hadn't had any good drink of water, weeks, sores breaking out all over their bodies, all kinds of bad things happening, and then here it gets pitch black. People just go in the fence, start pulling their hair. And the Bible said at this time, the only relief that you'll have is to chew your tongue. I mean, the pain will be so unbearable, it'll feel good to chew your tongue. Now, like I said, you can settle and be cool if you want to. And you can act tough and walk out that door this morning and say, I don't need Jesus. I, I can live my own life if you want to. I tell you, man, you ain't got good sense. You say, you're just trying to scare people. No, I'm just talking to people that ought to have enough sense to not want to go through a time like this. Yeah, so I'm brave. You ain't brave. You're stupid. That's right, brother. There's a difference in being brave and being foolish. Foolish. There's a difference between being brave and being stupid, folks. A man that says, oh, it'll not bother me. I don't care. I'm tough. I can handle it. He's, he's ignorant. I'm here to tell you this morning, you can say what you want to, do what you want to, go where you want to. One of these days, God's going to bring it to pass. If the Bible's true, and we know that it is. And the Bible says there'll be no place to hide. Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No one talking, no one looking around. This morning, there's an, I, I haven't even come close to describing the horror of this day. Every horror movie you've ever seen, brother, it'll, be, it'll make it look like a, a cartoon when this time comes to pass. Except it won't be in the movies. It'll be real in real life. I want to ask you to search your heart today and ask yourself this question. Am I saved? If Jesus come right now, would I go with him? I mean, honestly, folks, seriously. If Jesus Christ came right now, would you be taken out of this church or would you be left behind? Would there be one here this morning while the piano plays softly before we pray? Would there be one here this morning to say, Preacher, I'm here today and I need help. I need your prayers. I'm, I don't want to have to go through this time. I want to be taken up when Jesus comes after his children. I want to be saved in heaven with Jesus. Preacher, pray for me. I wonder if you just slip up your hand. Take it right back there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you back there. I see that hand. Thank God, thank God for people who are honest. Someone else, right quick. Someone else, we're here to do business with the Lord this morning. 
You say, preacher, remember me in this prayer. We're not going to come to you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to put you on the spot. We just want to pray for you. God bless you, sir. Someone else. God bless you, man. God bless you, man. God bless you. Someone else. Right quick. Right quick. God bless you, sir. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. God bless you. Someone else say, Brother Danny, I don't want to be here. Amen. God bless you. I want to be saved. I want to be with Jesus from that time. Pray for me. Slip up that hand. Take it right back down. Don't be ashamed. Amen. All right, we're going to pray this morning. I want you Christians to pray for these that raise their hands. I want you to ask God to do a great work in their heart and in their life right now. Then you that raise your hand, if God's speaking to your heart and you'd like to get this thing settled between you and him this morning, not let it go another day, you can settle it right here on this arm. If you'll come and say, Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned. I'm sorry for my sins. I believe you died for my sins. And mean that with all your heart. Jesus will save you right here. And you never have to worry about drinking blood and having these sores. You'll be in heaven with Jesus. I tell you, the smartest thing you ever do in your life is get this thing settled this morning. Our Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Dear God, your Spirit, Lord, would move on hearts by your tender mercy. In the name of Jesus, we ask, God, that you'd speak to someone's heart right now. In the quietness and the stillness of this hour, Oh, God, before the storm comes, before the world goes wild, oh, God, before the wrath of God's pulled out, I pray you'd touch someone here today and save them. Give them that peace and assurance that they're saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.